Thanks. Um, thanks very much. This is, uh, as a matter of fact, my first visit ever to the Ukrainian Media Center, although it is my uh, sixth visit to Ukraine during the last uh, seven, eight months or something like that, which is a uh, testimony to the fact, of course, that Ukraine is at the center of the tension, not only of Europe, but of the world and the importance of what is happening here. Uh, what am I doing? then you might uh, ask. Well, apart from coming now and then to Kiev for the political talks that of obvious, for obvious reasons are centered on the capital of the country, I made it a point to go to the different parts of Ukraine to look not only at the political situation but also at the potential, the economic potential at the, of the country. Because I think it is important to both to deal with the acute crisis, needless to say, but also to focus on the long-term issues, primarily economic, and the potential that Ukraine represents, uh, potential for Ukraine itself, but also potential for Europe as a whole. So I spent uh, yesterday and most parts of the day in the Kherson region, which is, of course, down in the south. I was, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in the Odessa, where I had been a couple of times before, but it was my first visit to the Kherson region. And um, I was impressed by what I saw down there in terms of uh, what I knew in theory before, but uh, could now see in practice the um, enormous potential that the country has in terms of food and food processing industry. Ukraine has some of the best agricultural lands in the world, and we are in a world where food will be in increasing demand. And I had the opportunity both to visit very successful Swedish investments that are doing extremely well in this particular area. I saw other international investors in the area in the same uh, same realm of business, and I had the opportunity to talk with quite a large number of Ukrainian businessmen in different sectors to discuss the problems as well as the possibilities. But I return from that uh, visit uh, even more confident about the potential that is there for Ukraine in the future. That being said, the country is going through very difficult also economic times. I've said it very many times before, this is the most misgoverned of all countries that were part of the Soviet Union once upon a time, with a substantially worse economic performance over the years. A lot of this we can blame on Yanukovych and the corruption, but not everything. Uh, the misgovernance has been there for a prolonged period of time. Now the crisis is deep, but in every crisis there's an opportunity. And I really salute the uh, government uh, of Prime Minister Yatsenyuk for the courage that he has demonst demonstrated with the uh, IMF program and with the deep and comprehensive reforms that will be there. Some of them painful, some of them I'm quite certainly not popular, but all of them absolutely necessary to turn this country around and to uh, demonstrate the full potential of Ukraine in the years ahead. For the people of Ukraine, as I said, uh, but also for all of Europe and for all of those that would be benefiting from a far better development of, uh, of, of, of the country. Um, I will be having talks here. I will be in the uh, square, whatever square it was, tomorrow morning. Sorry? Mastetska Arsenal. Mastetska Arsenal, yes. At 10 o'clock where we are celebrating Europe Day tomorrow together with the Prime Minister, uh, among others. Uh, prior to that, I will be with the Minister of Economic Affairs at the Kiev School of Economics and discussing primarily the economic development. Um, let me also say, uh, and very much welcome, I saw that you had a briefing on that earlier today, the um, report on the human rights situation in Ukraine by the United Nations that was uh, released earlier. I think this is a very comprehensive, uh, very impressive, very important report. It uh, refutes a lot of the Russian propaganda that the Russian media outlets are trying to pour over primarily uh, the population of Russia that is deprived of objective information, uh, but also other quarters. At the same time, as it does raise serious concerns, uh, the Crimean Tatar issue, uh, we get reports today about sort of uh, house searches and things like that on the Crimea, um, but also, of course, the uh, deteriorating situation for human rights in the east of the country. 
I, I think I stop there because otherwise it devel develops into a much too lengthy speech and then I can at least try to answer the questions that some of you might have. Do I want to use the headset? Good, I'm just going to Wait, wait, wait. Олена Матюцька, ТСН 1 плюс 1. У мене запитання з приводу санкцій, тому що крім кризи економічної, про яку ви говорили, зараз у нас доволі важко в політичному плані. І раніше не йшлося про дедлайн для Росії, якщо будуть якісь непорозуміння щодо України, а напередодні було сказано про 25 число. Тобто, що передбачає Європа і світ, що могла би зробити Росія, що вони говорять, що санкції будуть в уразі там чогось. Саме от йдеться про 25 число, про день виборів. Які санкції і чи дійсно вони будуть? Well, whether they will happen or not is uh, dependent upon uh, Russia and the behavior of Russia. Uh, as you know, we attach... Uh, as does everyone, uh, supreme importance to the presidential elections on May the 25th. And I'm deliberately not meeting any of the candidates in the presidential election when I'm here this time uh, for the reason that I think their, their prime task is not to meet with foreigners. Their prime task is to meet with the Ukrainian electorate these very days. And we've made very clear that uh, attempts by anyone to disrupt the election or to question the legitimacy of election is not acceptable. And um, that's where we end up with the sanctions issue. Uh, I think we were very clear from the uh, meeting of the EU foreign ministers on Monday. Then you might ask detail, what exactly does that mean? We don't answer that question deliberately. There has to be a certain vagueness to this. They should not be absolutely certain what will happen. They should be absolutely certain that if their uh, policies of destabilization goes on, we will take measures. Uh, then I have to add that I think that uh, if you look at the sanctions or restrictive measures that we have been taken, the far more effective, sorry to say, measures against the Russian economy has been taken by President Putin itself. I mean, the massive outflows of capital from the country. I mean, the figures that the ECB released the other days are really well beyond any figures that we uh, were aware of previously that are flowing out of Russia at the moment. And I know from my contacts with business circles in Sweden and elsewhere that uh, any thought of investments in Russia are, mildly speaking, on hold. This is doing long-term damage to the Russian economy. This is not a good thing. We don't wish Russia ill and the population. Uh, but these are the consequences of the uncertainty concerning the future of Russia that the policies of President Putin has, uh, has led to. But the return to the beginning of the answer, the uh, elections are really key. Uh, May 25th, if there will be a second round or not, remains to be seen. But uh, um, you have a government, uh, which is a fully legitimate government, by, by the way. I think that needs to be repeated sometimes. Uh, but you, uh, you only have an interim president, and, and, and I think it would be very good for the political stability of the country to have the fully legitimate political authorities on all levels as soon as possible. We have a question here, please. Alena Chernetska, Canal 24. Карло, скажіть, будь ласка, Європа наполягає все-таки на мирному вирішенні проблем на Сході. На вашу думку, як конкретно можна у мирний спосіб вирішити саме проблеми на Сході? І чи, можливо, потрібно домовлятися з мирним населенням, адже з сепаратистами не виходить? Of course, everyone wants a peaceful solution to the problems of the East, no question about that. And uh, I'm quite certain that is the determination of the Ukrainian authorities. Exactly how that should be done, that's the responsibility of them, not of us. And, and, and I have full confidence 
in the way in which these are handling these things. Then, at the same time, no question uh, that the Ukrainian authorities have a duty to uphold the law of the land and uh, try to sort of take action against illegal armed groups. They've done that very, very carefully. And, and I think they've given an emphasis to policies of dialogue. I think this will have to move on gradually. Um, and uh, I can only hope that it will be successful. Um, I haven't been to the East for two months. Um, and uh, um, at that time, which was before it became acute, uh, at that time, my feeling, and that was by previous feelings during previous visits as well, that uh, people in the East, they, they, they do have concerns. They have serious social and economic concerns. Donbass is a region with significant economic challenges ahead, significant economic challenges ahead. And I do understand that people are worried there. Uh, some of them feel that the authorities in Kiev, whichever those are, are not listening enough to the social and economic concerns they have. I mean, these things happen in all of our countries. So a dialogue on that, I think, is uh, very necessary. But I did not detect during my previous visits any urge or any support for uh, some of these illegal armed activities that we are seeing now. So there should be the possibility to move forward with dialogue. It is difficult to do in a climate that is very much driven by both the illegal armed groups, and, and, and let me add the factor that should not be neglected, Russian propaganda. I mean, some of you probably look far more on Russian television than I do, particularly for language reasons. And, and it, is, it is massive. It is a massive misinformation campaign that is fueling fears among people. I, I have a certain background from the Balkan Wars. Uh, and I saw down there in the beginning of the Balkan Wars how perfectly peaceful people who were living together um, suddenly sort of massive propaganda was saying the fascists, Stasha in that particular case, were coming to kill you. And first people don't believe it because they haven't seen any of those around. But, but, but uh, give it one week or two weeks or three weeks of that and some start to believe it and be genuinely afraid. So the, uh, and that's a message that we're also trying to give with very limited effect so far to the Russian authorities, that they have a response. Whatever you talk about Russian involvement in the East, the propaganda responsibility is clear cut from their point of view. I have a question here, please. Uh, my name is Mirek Toda, I'm from Slovakia, from newspapers. Uh, do you think that these elections on Sunday, they, they can be uh, fair, even, even with the situation on the East where uh, separatists hold uh, governmental buildings, uh, etc. And, and I would like to add, after this election, if you see it's necessary that uh, there will be change of government, it will be more co colorful with, from opposition members, and uh, if there is need for decentralization of, uh, of uh, the system of the country. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm not the one to form a government in Ukraine. Uh, I'm not even forming a government in Sweden. So, so I, 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 I leave that in the hands of the elected politicians of Ukraine and the president after the election. I'm quite certain there will be vivid discussion about that. As for the election, I mean, take my present immediate experience from Kherson region. Uh, no question, I mean, no one. I mean, perfectly normal. I mean, uh, I have no doubt that a free and fair election can be held across the vast territory of Ukraine. Uh, I'm also quite certain that some separatist forces will try to disrupt as much as they, they can in the East. And uh, I know that the citizens of Crimea will be deprived of their possibility of voting, or the arrangement will be done for those that can get out of the territory of Crimea and vote, although I think numbers will be fairly limited. Um, but uh, I think there will be sort of a free and fair election on the overwhelming part of the territory of, of of Ukraine. I have no doubt about that. Decentralization, uh, whatever federalization, whatever has been uh, talked about. Um, I've, I've said in discussions we've had inside the European Union on this, I have, I have urged caution um, in the sense, and that's based on my personal experience. I've been member of uh, two lengthy parliamentary reviews 
of the Swedish constitution, uh, including the division of responsibilities that we have between the different levels, particularly on the fiscal side. It's very complicated, even in a country like Sweden. I have a certain uh, experience of people doing too hasty decisions on those sorts of issues in the Balkans, and then you have to leave with the consequences for a very long time to come. Uh, how you organize a state is something that must be very carefully deliberated and discussed, particularly on the fiscal side. So I, I do think it is, in all countries, necessary, and, and m many countries have a very, 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 very vivid debate. I think the Belgians are now in their seventh big constitutional review on the division between the state and the different three levels in that particular case, so four, however you define it. Um, the Brits have their debates. Uh, in Germany, the question of division between the lender and the federal level is a very sensitive issue. Um, uh, so, yes, might well be, uh, but I think that discussion should not be... That is not something that can be dictated by foreign diplomats. That can only be decided by the elected politicians of Ukraine themselves after careful deliberation. I have a question here, Radio Liberty. Radio Liberty, Bogdana Kostyuk. Uh, according to information collected by Ukrainian and Western specialists, the Russian technical, military techniques, uh, which is quite close to the Ukrainian border, has been colored in the UN peacekeeping colors. If uh, tanks with such the colors are to cross the border, between Russia and Ukraine. What answer the European Union is able to give to Russia? Thank you. Well, I've, I've, I've seen those reports in the social media, but the pictures associated with the media, with those reports, do not show that. I mean, you, you know the UN peacekeeping colors is pure white. Uh, and so far I haven't seen any pure white tanks. <laughs> On the other side, I've, I've seen a lot of green things but I haven't seen any white things. Uh, so I, we, we, we follow reporting very closely, but, but that particular thing uh, can't be verified by, by, by the photos that have been showed. Uh, the, the tanks are distinctly green. Well, oh, there are green tanks across the border, that's for certain. Yeah. <laughs> if the green Sorry? What happens if the green tanks cross the border? If the green tanks cross the border, it's aggression. I mean, that's international law is as clear as it gets, and, and we've been very clear on what happened in Crimea on that particular respect. Be that green men, or be that green tanks, or be that green helicopters, or uh, even other colors, I have to say. Question here, please. Uh, you need translation. Uh, I think the inform was still correct. Зараз між Україною і Росією назріває чергова газова криза, і існує така, яка затрапне в тому числі Європейський Союз. Існує така ідея, щоб Брюссель надіслав своїх спостерігачів на газорозподільчі станції на Сході і на Заході України. Як ви відноситесь, відноситесь до цієї ідеї і взагалі які є механізми в Брюсселі для унеможливлення цієї кризи? Well, there are talks ongoing on that, but, but let me be quite honest with you. Um, I, I'm not sufficiently up to speed on the sufficient on an expert on the gas issues, and that goes to the simple fact that Sweden is one of the countries in the world or in Europe that has no, virtually no gas whatsoever. Uh, so we don't really have the expertise in Sweden to be able to assess these things, and accordingly, inside the European Union, when we discuss these things, I always defer to my colleagues from countries that uh, knows the issues far better. Um, so I, 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 I defer the, the answer to the question and I hope that there will be others available from the European Union side. But, but there are intense talks going on around it, and notably with uh, uh, Slovakia. Uh, I saw Miroslav, Minister Leitschak in Bratislava two days ago. Uh, my colleague Sikorsk, Radek Sikorsky from Poland is here today for talks, and I'm quite certain the issue will be on, on the agenda there. Mm -hmm. Mike? Um um, Foreign Minister, um, uh, can you tell us if, do you think that the EU has uh, the gumption and resolution 
to, uh, well, apparently, uh, you know, the Russians are never going to give Crimea back. This is part of their homeland now, and, and it's just Putin's invested way too much in it. Even if the, uh, you know, in the unlikely event everything settles down in the east and it remains Ukrainian, uh, do you still think that uh, the EU has the resolution to enact uh, long-term diversification from Russian resources to where in three, four, or five years, you're only, you're getting 30, 40% less gas, oil, timber, everything from Russia because you know, invaders aren't really reliable sources and, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, as a long-term punishment for their, their actions? Well, I think, uh, I think a number of the, uh, quite a lot of these things will happen by itself. Uh, so irrespective of sanctions. I mean, what is very, very important for business relationship, for economic relationships, is predictability. Businessmen want predictability. They want reliability. If you do a sort of business with someone, you must trust that particular person or that particular business or the politics of that particular country. And what President Putin has done is done Russia, he's made Russia into an unpredictable country. And uh, business don't like to make business with unpredictable partners. And countries who are dependent upon sort of gas supplies would like to diversify. Uh, whether they will cut, I don't know. That's up to them to decide. But I think you, you see the rush be going on for quite a number of years, but these things take time to build pipelines and LNG terminals so they can diversify. Uh, and I'm quite certain that will happen. Um, will, be, will sort of Russian raw materials be completely of no use? No. I mean, Sweden, as I said, we have no gas whatsoever. Um, do we buy Russian oil? Yes, we do. Do I know how much we buy? Well, a couple of months ago, I know that we took 40% of our oil for a month. Do I know what's going to be next month? No, I don't, because that market is entirely different. Um, it can be zero one month, it can be 80% another month. We are not dependent upon it, but of course the oil is there on the world markets. And, and, and uh, uh, that I, I, I think is the important thing. But let me then say also uh, that the most important thing to help Ukraine is not what we can do to sort of sanction Russia. Because even if sanctions work, they work fairly long term. Uh, the most important thing is to bring stability to Ukraine. Uh, it is the democratic stability of Ukraine. It is the credibility of the economic reforms of Ukraine. It is the democratic maturity of Ukraine that at the end of the day is going to decide um, the outcome of it. Uh, if Ukraine were to fail in its politics or fail in its economy, then it will be different. If Ukraine succeeds in its politics and succeeds in economic reforms, then Ukraine will be a strong country to be able to withstand pressures and destabilization. So the main trust of our policies is really to help with the stability, I said, to, to simplify from the European Union policies, policies are to help with, to stabilize Ukraine, while Russia at the moment is to destabilize Ukraine. Uh, and and the, the success of these particular, the balance between those efforts that is going to be decisive, and the decisive effort there is going to be made by the Ukrainian politicians themselves. Please. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Thomas Hall from the Swedish Daily Dagens Nyheter. Uh, when you it. When you were talking about the situation in, in uh, eastern Ukraine, you were talk also talking about the, the necessity of dialogue mm. uh, to resolve the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, Wednesday this week, this uh, national dialogue started with, uh, under participation of the OSCE. The separatists were not invited and didn't take, uh, did not take part there. Do you think it would be wise to try to include them? And, I've and invite them. Well, I mean, I, I, I was down in Kazan and other places, so I didn't follow it, but I, I will see Ambassador Ishing, who is an old friend of mine, later today to, to get his assessment of the situation. I have emphasized that I, I think the main dialogue must be with the democratic elected politicians of the East. I've, I made a point of meeting, uh, uh, trying to meet as many representatives also of the party. I met party of regions down in Kazan yesterday. 
uh, I met a number of uh, RADA representatives of the Party of Regions from the East when I was here the last time. They are the elected representatives of the people of, of, of the East. And, and I think those should be the number ones that one talks to. Um, uh, is there going to be a second stage of some sort with the, uh, with the legal separatists or with armed people? That's not for me to judge, but I don't think that should be the same thing. I think it is the elected representatives of the people in Donetsk or Lugansk or wherever it is, Sharkov, those are the ones that should be. And, and then it's for them, really, to go out and anchor their policies with the people. Because otherwise there's a risk of, if you take steps and say that you invite all of these green guys with guns uh, to the table, then you sort of delegitimize the democratic institutions of the country. And that, I think, would be long, do long-term damage. Have a, Sorry? I have a question need, uh, But at some stage, you need some kind of dialogue even with those people, don't you? Could be, but, but, but I think if, if that is also a responsibility of perhaps the elected representatives to see how, how that could be done. And I, I'm, as, as you notice, I'm rather cautious in giving too much public advice on, on these things because I think that they are the ones that knows the, know, well, I'm not quite certain they know these people, but, but they, they have the credibility among the people. Uh, it's also a question of isolating these uh, guys from uh, the popular support that they might have or might gain if this continues. I think this is extremely important that, that, that you sort of try to isolate them through the dialogue and exactly what happens then in the later stage. Um, we should not uh, create the impression that you can get influence by a gun and uh, that the, those that are democratically elected are irrelevant. And as I said, I mean, the, the East is dominated by the Party of Regions. The Party of Regions is, has gone through, through a very difficult time. But we should not forget that during the elections for X numbers of years, it's been the single largest political party of the country. And, and they have elected representatives. I have a question here, please. Interfax Ukraine, Igor Solovey. We have a lot of significant influence on the east of Ukraine, Russian propaganda. Чи в той же час українські високопосадовці говорять і про збройне втручання через диверсійні групи і інші збройні формування Російської Федерації? Чи є у вас, чи ви вірите цим повідомленням і чи є у вас свідчення, підтвердження збройного втручання Російської Федерації на територію України? As I said, I've, I've, I've been in primarily Donetsk quite a number of times during the years, and I've also been visiting the shops there now and then, going around in the streets. And I've, I've never noticed that you can buy RPGs or, 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 or anti-aircraft missiles or heavy machine guns in the shops of Donetsk. Uh, it's a novelty. Uh, and I'm quite certain I would have been made aware of if that was the fact. If, 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 if you look at some of the military equipment, not all of it, uh, but, but if you look at some of the military equipment uh, that is there, I mean, there's, I, I, I made a tweet somewhat ironic the other day when uh, they were shooting down two helicopters with missiles, uh, and I said it might have been some elderly ladies who passed by the grocery stop, shop and picked up uh, an anti-aircraft missile. Uh, that's clearly not the case. Uh, these things are coming from somewhere, and uh, some of them have the markings of a nearby country. A final question, as I understand. Kiev Post, Mark Krzykiewicz. Um, how prepared is the EU to, um, back about the sanctions, how prepared is the EU to scale up sanctions to um, apply them to sector-wide um, areas of Russia's economy, being whether it's finance or energy or high tech, um, should further aggression take place? Because we've seen a reluctance, primarily from Great Britain, uh, Germany, and France, who have given priority to 
profit motive, business relations, and other. Do you see um, a, you know, a resolve in the EU to, to, ups, you know, to upgrade the, the sanctions? Thank you. Um, on Monday in, uh, in, in, in Brussels, one of the decisions that we took was to prepare exactly that. Uh, because we, we, we had a, our, our le the legal framework that we had in place prior to that did not allow it. So now we have uh, changed and have a new legal framework that allows for exactly that. Uh, and that was a unanimous decision. So the readiness there, I mean, the sort of the formal legal preparations for that uh, are now in place, yes. Minister, thank you so much for your time. We're conscious of your schedule. We would love to, for this conversation to go on, but thank you very much for visiting Ukraine Crisis Media Center. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.